Welcome to the Westside Barbell Podcast. Today's topic is a review of Louis Simmons' injuries and the methods he used to recover from them. Louis' injuries is a double-edged sword because due to all that he put his body through has allowed us to train pretty much 99.9% injury free. Now Lou, this is a long list of injuries we can go through, um, but I'd like to start off, I think, really at, in 73, if that's possible, with um, you had a L5 fracture and a sublexed SI joint. So take us through when that happened, how it occurred, and what you did to recover from that injury. Okay, Tom. Uh, remember, guys, this is what I did to recover myself. I'm not telling you to do any of this, uh, but it's worked great for me. It enabled me to make top 10 in the world for 34 years. I was a national record holder in 1971, national champion in 2000. In 2004, I was sixth in the bench. When I was 57, I was 10th in the deadlift. And, um, you know, I did it out of learning how to train correctly after banging myself up. So basically, I will start back in 73. In 1973, I just made a 1655 total. At that time, at 180 pounds, there was two hours uh, weigh-ins. No gear of any kind. Wasn't even allowed to wear a wrist strap in 1973. IPF had just had been started. Olympic weightlifting belt. No power belts was around. No, no suits, no wrap. or wore singlet. That's it. Uh, in the world's in, in November of 72, I was won by um, uh, Bob McGee. He totaled 1635, so I actually hit 20 pounds more than what had just won the world championships. I just jumped in from November uh, in uh, 72. I had done 1555. And so in three months later, I jumped 100 pounds of my total, basically by doing a lot of mental training. But um, I lived on good mornings. I was able to do 435 for five in the bent over good morning. I pyramided all the way up, and I pyramided all the way back down. And at 315, I worked up in five rep segments. But then going back down, when I hit 315, it was 10 reps. And then 275 for 10, two and a quarter for 10. And then 20 with 185 and 20 with 135. But a good morning was the key of all my success. But I lost my concentration, and that's when I occurred this injury. And uh, so I was going to all kinds of people. No one, no one seemed to be able to fix me at all. So I, I was going to have to fix myself. I was on crutches for 10 months. I couldn't stray on ear lay because of sciatica. And I mean, no matter what I did, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do good mornings, back raise, side bends. I lived on that 180 pound side bends. Um, I also had a 670 pound deadlift in that contest. Uh, I couldn't squat or deadlift, couldn't do anything, couldn't work. So one day I was, you know, I was trying to do back raises and just by applying pressure to my ankles to raise my torso, it would kill me. So I was thinking one day by myself, what if I did it in reverse? So I decided to take my, go home and get in the power rack. I trained in my garage. I actually, at that time, my basement. Um, I put up um, a couple two by tens on the safety pins in the power rack and got up and I saw my feet under and um, lifted my feet to the rear and no pain for the first time in basically a year. And it also pumped up my back. So I knew I had something. So that's, that was how I started reverse hyper exercise. I'm sure people were doing this over in Europe, uh, you know, a hundred years before this. But I didn't know it, and uh, you know I just come across caught it, and that it, it saved me. Nowadays, we've had actually six United States patents and international patents on this machine. Um, so basically, that's how it started. And then in 19, um, so how I recovered was basically by doing the reverse hypers, doing reverse hypers and abs and trying to stretch. I recovered, and actually to the point back in, in um, you know by 1978, I was back in the top 10, fourth in the dead, I pulled 710 at 195. And uh, so I, I made a pretty good recovery. But unfortunately, uh, I broke it again in 1981, early 1981. And I, I knew that I'd done it, but I didn't want to admit it to myself. So I just kept training right up to the end of the year, and I finally got smashed. And so I went and saw a surgeon here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, the surgeon wanted to uh, remove two discs, take off bone spurs, and fuse my lower back. He told me to come back in a couple of days, and we would talk more about it. I said, okay, doc, and I never went back. Uh, I basically said, no way, Jose, I'm not doing this. And um, uh, so I, I went home and I started doing, I went back to doing reverse hypers. Oh, by the way, I couldn't lay down this time for 17 weeks. I could not lean myself backwards. It hurt too bad. So um, I believe I broke my upper back at the same time, but no one paid attention to that. But basically I went back and I started doing reverse hypers, acupuncture and acupressure. I had a really good acupuncture here at the time. And, and then stretching. Um, and, and again, so I recovered to the point I was in 1971 in 2000, 2005 or six when I was 57, I pulled a 715 deadlift point 217. 
And uh, also, in um, when I was 63 years old, I pulled 675 in a meet at 217. So I fully recovered. Nothing wrong with my back today. I mean, I, I learned how to uh, prevent a bad back. You know, there's, there's so many ex, uh, experts out there, experts on, uh, you know, bad backs. I think I'm an expert on a healthy back. So I think you ought to look for someone that knows how to keep a back healthy instead of going and, and have to do nothing for you. Because that's exactly what this, uh, the, the spot I was in back in 1973. And I didn't go to anyone in 1981. I did it myself. So anyhow, that's how my, you know, my back started. So I realized also at that time, you have to do a lot of abs. I started doing a lot of stand-up abs, stabby, static abs. Your, your uh, rectus abdominals, you're not doing setups when you lift. They have to be very strong, especially the obliques. This is all for all sports, but particularly for ours where you stand with massive weights on your back. So a lot of oblique work, a lot of abdominal work, static stuff. I do it as stand-up abs in a lap machine. I do a lot of just static stuff, almost like pummeling with someone. And uh, also, nowadays, what we do uh, is a lot of reverse hypers, of course, and belt squats. We stand a belt squat machine. There's a chiropractor here in town who uses a belt squat. He calls it the spinal liner. Both these exercises, you can do an enormous amount of tonnage in, and at the same time, they're traction devices. And a uh, few other things I do, make sure you um, have a, a couple traction uh, machines in your gym. I have a traction machine, an inverse table, you know, a good one from a chiropractor. I have a neck traction machine. So uh, we do a lot of that. And you know, why I'm on the, why I'm on the subject too, um, Tom, you saw my MRIs, my neck and my upper back. It's just basically fused together. Mm -hmm. And I could never get an arch and a bench or a squat. <clears throat> and so I found out by taking this ball and I put this in my lower back and how a lot of people bench press, you've seen it where they pull their heels up under you and drive their feet down and you know, keep their butt on the bench and arch. This, this brought back my lower back um, um, flexibility where I could arch. Then I just thought, well, my upper back is so bad, why not start rolling it up? So I rolled it into to the thoracic and on, on up and I would get on a bench, put it on my back, and my shoulders would be about that far off the bench. I'd load up a bar and a bench press, put you up on it, and literally force my traps down to the, to the bench. That's how I gain range of motion and get my range of motion back in my upper spine. And I really highly recommend this. Not only uh, does this work, it also stretches out the psoas. And one thing uh, John can may maybe come up with why reverse hypers work, we do a lot, I have a, uh, a dual pins and reverse hyper. We do a lot of one-legged reverse hypers. And basically, when you get on the machine and do this, it'll stretch out the psoas. It's an open chain exercise. And John, I, I, could you just explain briefly about what it does? Yeah, the, <clears throat> the, the reverse hyper does a lot of stuff. <clears throat> uh, one of the big things, except, especially for lifters, that it does is it enables, it uh, gets back functionality back into the spine. And by functionality, I mean the actual uh, joint segments of the lumbar spine. So a lot of times when you're deadlifting, when you're squatting, there's an isometric contraction in the lumbar spine and you're trying not to move it, right? Well, what happens is the, as you become very good at iso holding the isometric contraction, it's gonna create a lot of uh, compression on the disc, especially if you're loading it in a squat, stuff like that. <clears throat> what the uh, reverse hyper does when you're in the bent pendulum, especially, it, it drives you into uh, uh, hip flexion even more in a traction position. And it enables the uh, discs uh, or the, the spinal joints to start to segment. And when I mean segment, envision like a train going over a track. If you got, if you, each cart you want to go over one at a time. And what that is, it's very, it's very therapeutic for the discs while at the same time you're training the discs to increase the biological capacity of what those discs can do. So you're really mitigating injury, it's very therapeutic and it's, it's gonna enable you to lift a lot longer. Um, you know, currently we have 24 800 pound deadlifters, getting ready to be number 25. Uh, our top 10 deadlift average is 866 pounds. Our top five is 890 pounds. We have no back injuries. We live on reverse hypers. Our formula for uh, basically training is the volume of your squat. If you, you know how we do the volume of our squat, we do 25 squats, you, uh, you multiply that and then you come up with the total volume. But our reverse hypers is four times the volume of our squats. And it's done twice a week on speed day, on uh, speed strength day, and max effort day. So we do enormous amount of reverse hypers. I'm talking 60,000 pounds and more. So, uh, and why do we do that? It's a single joint motion, uh, like John was talking about. It, it, rotates, it rotates the sacrum, am I right? Yeah. Uh, builds the spinal rectors, the glutes, and the hamstrings. 
It builds them all together so you do not have any muscle imbalances. Too many people have tremendously strong backs, and but no glutes. They can't lock out weights. They wonder why they get up, their legs are bent, and they can't lock it out because their glutes are weak. So this is a, a tremendous glute builder as well. And you know, basically all you trap back elites out there, a lot of top trap guys will do a lot of isolation, isometrics on the glute muscles. So that's exactly what we do. Yeah. So um, uh, that's why it's so important to do that. And well, we also do it in the belt squat. In the hamstrings too. That's because right. if you look at the hamstrings, you're training the hamstrings from an open chain. Yes. Because the reverse hyper, if you look at the, uh, the fibers of the hamstring, they're rather linear. It, right, and so a lot of people like, for instance, the inverse leg curl was a closed chain one to train the hamstrings, but the reverse hyper would be a complement of a open chain to also train the hamstrings, so you capture both open and closed chain movements. Uh, years ago, I had a lady here. She ran track for Ohio State, then Athletes West, and then decided. So I worked with her for track and helped her track times out uh, enormously, but um, she ended up being a holding the world record in squat years ago with barely any gear squat, five sixty seven one sixty three. They, they had her go to Ohio State in the exercise phys lab and touched her hamstring quad ratio. Her hamstring was 60, quad 40. It's, it's supposedly one of the it's highest it ever rested at Ohio State by a mile. And they wanted to know how I'd done it, and I told them, well, come on down. i got 10 people to test like this. Why? Because of the, the nature of how we train. All posterior train chain, and posterior trains everything. So it's all reverse hypers, uh, glued hams, inverse curls, which we'll get into in a little bit. But that's how we protect ourselves from injury. Remember, it's a single joint. Why, why all you uh, college people out there, and you go into class for your exercise fist, and you're only allowed to do single joint exercises for your thesis? Because they consider multi-joint exercise, like deadlift, squat, bench, too dangerous, power clean. So they want you to only work one joint, and, um, and uh, a lot of times on a side bench machine at that. So that's exactly, I follow this. We work, we train in single joint. That way, whatever the weakest portion of your back is, or, or I mean your body, we can put the most emphasis in to uh, decrease muscle imbalances, and that's why we don't have any injuries now. Louis, when you were overcoming your injuries in 73 and 81, there were surely some exercises that you found that were a no-go, especially in the, in the rehabilitation of your lower back. Was Literally, there any? I could not do any. I could not squat. I could not deadlift. I, lived, I did 180-pound side deadlifts. I could not do side bench, period. Um, Back raises, I, I used 135 for sets of five in the back raise. Could not begin to do a back raise. As soon as I put pressure on my heels, my lower back would kill me. And uh, I mean, I, I couldn't work. I, I mean, I was out, I was gone. And I mean, there's literally no exercise I could do. And uh, so, like I said, by, in my opinion, pure luck, but you know, I just thought of a simple way. What if I did a back raise in reverse? And that's how it works. And doing the reverse hyper, you know, it's, it's, it's an everyday staple here at Westside. But are you doing a disservice? And we talk about a stomach. If you don't train your stomach as much as you do the reverse hyper. No, your stomach, I, in my opinion, your stomach has to be the strongest muscle in the body. You know, when you're born, you're connected to your mother through your stomach. And then when you, anyone that picks up a weight or pushes, what do you do? Right? First thing you do, you better take a gulp of air and hold it. And, uh, and you, you want to hold it in your stomach, not in your chest. You want to hold it in your stomach. So... That's, um, that's why I believe the stomach's so important. That's why I mentioned doing uh, um, just stand-up abs. I do a lot of static abs. And if you talk to a lot, again, like talk to people, they think any ab exercise is retarded except for side bends and static abs. That's all they think you should do. So, I mean, that's just by what me, I do that. But I also do a lot of leg raises. To me, it's mobility. I lay down and pull my, my feet over my head. And um, bent leg, straight leg, with weights. Years ago, Matt Dimmel was one of our, is our first world record holder in a squat. He did 1,010 and held up back and party in the gear. He held up for seven years. And Matt would do straight leg setups with his feet, with a barbell behind his back, a barbell. He could do setups 115 pounds. Now, Paul Childers was right behind that. And Paul ended up squatting, doing better gears. Paul ended up squatting around 1160. And Paul, I think, was doing them with like 100 or a little more. But you got it. But you know, as John would tell you, your hip flexor is going to be involved in all this. You want to build all the muscle groups. But um, a lot of abs, you got to train your abs every day. I mean, I, I believe you should go in the gym. Here's how I warm up. I don't, I, I don't think anyone should ever stretch before they train. Stretching should be another workout. Uh, on the squat and bench days, on the two days a week, I come in, I would do two sets of reverse hypers and abs. And that's how I warmed up. Or I pulled a sled. And I would do a couple set of abs, and I was ready to go. That was my, I, I was ready. I would squat. I'm, I'm, my activity is squatting, I'm warming up in the squat. Deadlift, I'm going to warm up in the deadlift. My deadlifts, I would start, I mean, I'm not the greatest, you know, 
but I would start my deadlifts with 345 and 220 pound of band tension. I didn't put a plate on and another plate. I started with that weight with 220 pound of band tension. You know, I, I mean, I was I could pull over 700 pretty easy, you know, in, in my 50s, and uh, but that's how I did it. So I never had an injury, never hurt myself one time. Um, what's the correct way to execute a reverse hyper? How to do it? I, I know a lot of people do it incorrect, but um, should you try to limit the range of motion? Should you go through a full range of motion? Should you go fast? Should you go slow? Is there a correct way to do it? They have to be controlled, and I think I'm just going to let John explain why you have to take your get the feet underneath. I mean, that's actually why a lot of our patents are patented the range of motion. And I'll let John explain why, how to do a reverse hyper and why we do it that way. Yeah, from a, I think you can use the reverse hyper. It's a good machine because you can use it in a multitude of ways. From a therapeutic perspective, if you're trying to enhance spinal functionality, you want to take it through the full range with a load that is safe, right? So all biological tissues have a load absorbing capacity, right? And as long as you stay under that capacity, you're not gonna injure yourself, right? <clears throat> now, in order to increase the capacity of any tissues, you gotta stress them, meaning you have to go into those dangerous ranges and you got to actually train them. When I do a reverse hyper to try to increase the functionality of my spine, I basically contract my glutes and my hamstrings uh, and I go up to almost parallel or thereabout, doesn't have to be exactly parallel, but you want to get motion in the vertebrae, right? In a straight line. In a straight line, right? <clears throat> and so then what happens is I let it go under, however, I control it as it goes under. So it's a controlled eccentric, but for me personally, I try to take my legs as far under as possible because that's, I think, really where the magic of the machine happens, right? Because now, you know, if you look at all these studies where they say spinal flexion is dangerous, spinal flexion is dangerous. Well, if spinal flexion is dangerous and we know that we don't have capacity in those ranges as lifters or athletes or just everyday humans, you want to go into those ranges, start to capture those ranges, increase capacity in those ranges so that you start to mitigate injury. So I let, my, I let it go under and I try to take it under using basically my hip flexor, my psoas, quadrates and borum, iliac, like that whole psoas complex, try and actually take it under but I, I want to control it the entire time. And the entire time, I'm also, I have my hands on the handle and I'm trying to traction your thoracolumbar fascia, your lats, all that stuff, so that you get a very good mechanical force into those tissues, so you get functionality into those tissues, so that now you have a good functioning spine. Now let's go load the spine. What you know John I mean? was saying is exactly what I do. When I go underneath, I actually slide off the machine. Yeah. And then when I come up, I pull myself back up. Yeah. I slide out, yeah. pull back up. It's... Slide out, pull back up. Yeah. And and he brought up the point. He said eccentrically. The reverse hyper, people swing the reverse hyper. It has a centric, concentric, and a static portion. And if you do it totally correctly, think this, guys. You start the action with your heels. You start to pull with your heels, contract, you know, of course, your calves and your hamstrings and your glutes and your spinal rectors in that direction. But start with the heel, let it... Um, circulate up into the low back and the, and the glutes right and the cool part about that is so that's the way that i do it to increase spinal functionality yes. right. right but then the what he's what lou was talking about earlier about actually loading the spine and really increasing it so that you don't get uh, uh out of balance from all the deadlifts and the squats now on that one you're probably going to shorten the range and not go under as much but well, we go under pretty far yeah i mean i've actually got guys they use 50 percent of their squat and I've, I've had two 1,200-pound squatters that do the math. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the day we got a new kid, and he was using 400 pounds for 35 reps. All right? He's a, he, he can deadlift about 18 right now. So, and he's a, his, his, his squat's 940. Mm -hmm. He's tall, built to deadlift, but we're going to raise those lifts up. So we do, remember, four times of volume, that's how much we pay attention. And also, uh, years ago, Coach Ox saw at the time he was in Minnesota, and he bought three reverse hypers. I told him he could train his lower back five days a week. He said, nobody can train their lower back five days away. I said, I'm telling you, you can do it. A month later, he bought three more machines. But then I got a phone call from the Minnesota, a Minnesota uh, Exercise Phys Lab, and they wanted to know if I knew why you could use the machine five times a week, because they were doing just that. And I go, to be honest with you, I don't. I, I, I don't. And they told me it, open, it opens up the disc and allows spinal fluid into the spine every time you use it. So we do them no less than four times a week. Two very heavy, high volume, very heavy, and to, and to about 50% of that. 
protect it. I like them on a bench press day. Or after you squat or deadlift, go back in the next day and do them again. It takes all your soreness. Anybody that sits at a desk, just walk in, do a set of reverse hypers, and your pain's all gone. So, yeah. what, what do you say to those that think the reverse hyper is dangerous? Well, they're, they're um, unknowledgeable. They've never used it. You know, there's a lot. Of, I hear a lot of guys talk about reverse hypers. I, I'll guarantee you, they've never used one. And everybody knows about West Side, but they've never been here. <laughs> you got to come to West Side. Everybody taunted. They all think they can train at West Side, don't they? Until they mm -hmm. show up. And what happens to them? They're on their knees. They can't. I mean, and, do I, and we never, I would never try to do that. They cannot do the training. It, it takes a month or two. It actually takes 10 months to acquire the ability to do the volume that we do. That's why. We broke way over 100 world records, right around 140 world records. And, and yeah, we're still breaking world records. Right. <laughs> we just broke one two, three weeks ago. Yeah, and I think as long as you have the prerequisites required and you know how to load your tissues, mm -hmm. you know your threshold, and you know where you're at, it's not dangerous at all. The problem is people don't, they get in the machine, they have no concept of what, what they're supposed to be doing with it. They don't know the form. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the technique, the mechanics of what's going on, and they don't understand that, you know, progressive overload. You need to start somewhere, mm -hmm. and it's not going to be at the top. You need to learn how to do it. Then you need to progressively start to overload the tissues. You also have to be on a real reverse hyper. Yeah. A real one. Don't get on a piece of junk that people sell. You know, a lot of people, you know, one of my, I have a trademark, and, and it says, often imitated, always irritated. Because every time I turn around, someone's trying to copy what we're doing. And you know that's okay. I, I don't. They say it's a form of flattery. I don't care. I don't even. I don't care about these people. I'm not going to expose their name because they don't deserve any credit for doing anything. Yeah. And from um, a therapy point of view, if you had someone who just come in off the street, how would you run them through a reverse hyper protocol, John? Yeah. So I mean, I work in a, in a medical setting uh, with people that have legitimate pathology uh, in, in the spine. It, it all depends on the individual. I mean, one of the things that, you know, uh, I talk about a lot is people can't, they don't segment their spine. They, the, the lumbar spine doesn't function, and that's the reason why they're having issues. So I need to put them in a setting where I can start to get their lumbar spine to segment and where we can start to get it to function. Now, a lot of people, uh, maybe in the physical therapy or therapeutic side of it, will get people and they'll do what's called a cat camel. Uh, which is where you're trying to uh, get the the spine to fully flex and extend. It's it's kind of like a yoga thing too. Um, <clears throat> that's a good thing to do. However, the problem is there's no way to progressively overload that. So you're you're acquiring maybe more function, but you're not increasing the capacity of the tissues because there's no external load. So what I do is I use the reverse hyper to pretty much do the same thing. Uh, except we have a load now. So now we can start to externally load those tissues so that we can start to not only increase the functionality of the individual spine, but also increase the capacity of their biological tissues to start to mitigate injury uh, at the same time. Yeah, I want to bring up a point too. You talk about people bending over and they shouldn't bend over, but migrant workers bend over all the time, pick up fruit, they have no back problems. And also uh, our biggest out of 915 with no gear, Chris Spiegel pulls 95% stiff leg. He barely just knee flexion, leg straight, and pulls up 9.15 in a meet. Uh, years ago, Vincent Edel, Tommy, I know you saw pictures of him. You saw him pull 8.10. I saw him pull 8.21. Uh, 99% straight leg, bent over to head lift. And KK, the great, you know, the great guy from overseas, uh, pulls 9.47. How's he deadly? All bent over. You know what I mean? They don't have back problems. They have strong backs. Right. Yeah. And the thing about it, and I mean, it's just like we say all the time is, you know, People, you know, people will say, hey, this exercise is dangerous and that's dangerous, but it's only dangerous if you don't understand the mechanics of it and you don't understand what your capacity is. The only way to increase, you know, people can say the bench press is dangerous for your shoulders and bad for your safety, but if the bench press has got prerequisites, if you don't have the required prerequisites, then yeah, it is going to be detrimental to you, right? I, yes. but, but that's the thing is it's not dangerous. And technically, if we know that a lot of disc issues occur in... Uh, flexion of the spine, mm -hmm. then we should probably start to go into flexion exactly. of the spine and train it. If you get hit in the face all the time, you better learn to put your hands up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the most dangerous thing in a gym or in a, uh, a setting where you have to train athletes is the instructor. If he's unknowledgeable, you have a lot of injuries. I, kn I know of cases uh, that 40% of athletes are hurt in D1 schools. 
40 percent yeah that is insane well it's like this think about it is let's say that you get a you get a soft tissue strain where you you've torn some sort of connective tissue right then people will say rest that okay well realistically you should look be looking how to rest it right you should be looking okay how can i start to load this tissue right in a safe setting so that i can start to get good stressor inputs so that i'm going to start to increase and aid in the healing process does that make sense? Well, John, I, I know you bodybuild a lot. And you, you know, your legs would be sore from, I know, the massive reps you do. I helped you a couple of times. But if you went the next day and you're sore, what did, what did you do? You went and got in the leg press did a few reps of soreness from one away. Right, exactly. It didn't make it more sore. It took it away. Right. And so, you know, you can't be a puss all your life. You actually got to train. Uh, the only way to become a high-level athlete is adaptation. You have to do a higher volume on a, on a basic method of attaining that over years. And also taking your one rep max uh, percentages up slightly all the time. Right. That's the key to training. Right. So what you said is it's a process. It's a process. And so that's the thing is you got to invest time into the process. Yeah. It's not something that's going to occur overnight. You got to learn the mechanics of it. You got to understand what you're trying to do and you got to progressively start to overload those tissues. Yeah. And that would make it safe. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, Tom, you see how many times, like, and I silent Joe, I know he probably trains no no less than eight times and maybe ten. No, he's no, he trains like I did when I could train. He does real, eight to ten real workouts a week. Mm -hmm. And he's gone from, uh, you know, basically, I don't know, maybe 1,800 to 2,235 in two years at 198. Both seven and a quarter deadlift, nine and a quarter squat. So he's jumped way up. How? By doing a lot, and he's massively thick, very muscular. Yeah. Isn't probably the... The most dangerous thing you can be is weak. That's probably one of And then think about what, what makes you weak, not having stressors to come into the system. So that's where it always goes back to, I don't care how strong someone is, if you're deadlifting and you're trying to do max effort work, or even if you're doing repetition method, eventually your, your, your uh, mechanics are gonna fail and you're gonna go into more flexion. Now you better hope that you've trained your discs to handle that, that load. Because if not, now you're, now you're gonna injure yourself. But if you go into the reverse hyper and you start to build up the capacities of those tissues, you, it, it, now you can mitigate injury or even totally prevent it from occurring. That's why you need great internal abdominal pressure. That's why you want to push out on your belt. I don't know where people get sucking in on, you know, sucking your stomach in, it's retarded. Uh, you have to push out on your belt. The more pressure you have in the abdominal, the less pressure on the spinal cord. I was in a thesis back in the early 80s to prove that for wire, one in my stomach and one in my thoracic area. And, um, you know, we proved what a weightlifting belt does. Everyone theorized what it did, but no one knew. My, actually, uh, one of my first um, uh, athletes, Mariah Leggett, PhD in exercise phys, you know, it was her study, and I was the first one to be in the study. Over 20 people. So. Yeah. Well, if we progress on from your first injury of a long list of injuries you've had, um, in 79, yeah. is that the first time you... Tore a bicep off? Yeah, 79. I mean, that's a, that's a small one. We'll go to 79. Right. I tore my bicep off. Um, you know, I, I, had, um, I had a 462 bench and a, an open up 677 deadlift. And I, and I pulled it easy. It's called, the meat was called Meltdown in Mississippi because it's so human. And um, a man called Brother Benny started the ADFPA. He had no air conditioning. So everybody was dropping the bar. And I locked it out. And... Before I got a down signal, it starts slipping, they don't give me down until my bicep off. Now John can explain what happened to my arm, I have no arm. All right, and, uh, but, so powerlifting you know, USA, Mike Lambert said that, uh, in the next issue he said, Louie was done. Well I got back, of course, on, uh, I got back Sunday night from the meet in Mississippi, and I had two surgeons all set up, I went, actually three, two of them said operate, and the third one said, if you don't care what it looks like, don't operate, but well, I don't care what it looks like, I'm not the prettiest guy in the world. So I started training, and I immediately went out, and how I recovered from that, oh, well, what I did, I went back in the gym, and I started on a high pin, lifting uh, 705 off a high pin. And then week after week, I lowered it, all right? And I just, and, and uh, I mean, I'll die if I'm lying. Two weeks later, guys in Black's Health were one of the strongest gyms in the country back then, Steve Wilson, Haas the Boss, and some guys came down. I raw, I raw bench 485. Now, when that meet, I bench 460, it's touch and go, 485, my arm is still black and blue. I just want to see what would happen. I said, well, hell, I got these guys here. Let's find out. And so six months later, when they said I was done, I went to uh, the Y Nationals, which is tough. Me with Roger East, they being world record order. I went there and won my first Nationals with a 480 bench. So remember, there was no shirts back then. I weighed 212 and uh, pulled a 705 deadlift. All right? So that's how I rehabbed. 
And also, I would I realized right away my arm would just go like this, and it'd go back up. And I thought, well, you know, when the guy said if he didn't care, it would look like. I said, well, there's got to be some scar tissue or something hanging on there. So I started curling, and you know, a two and a half pound plate, and I got to a ten pound plate, and it snapped. And my arm never got black or blue until that point. And then you know, this is like a week after the meet. Then it got all black and blue. But I had great full range of motion. I could touch up here, straight my arm out. And I was off and running. That's how I basically done it. I mean, you, you got to be. I remember John Black, who owned John uh, Black Shelford, I talked about. He blew both kneecaps off in the late 70s. And he had plastic kneecaps. You know, I think as you know, way now they're way better. But he, the, the Cleveland Brown surgeon worked on him at the time, that, that surgeon, the Cleveland Browns. And he said, therapy must be on the edge. Take it to the very edge without falling off, stop, and then, you know, repeat it the next time. And I've always used that advice for what he said. I've taken myself to the very limit of getting hurt, you know, just sensing if I go one more, I'm going to die, and then start back over and work it up three or four weeks to pass that. That's how I've always done it. Very aggressive, um, you know, very, very aggressive uh, you know, rehab. And I rehab myself. I don't, go to, I don't go to people. I don't believe in them. If you don't have a scar, I'm sorry, guys. I don't believe you know what you're doing. If you ain't got flat nose and, and scar tissue on your eyes, you, you can't teach me how to fight. I just can't do it. Yeah. When you tore off your bicep and was deadlifting, did you change your grips? Uh, Tom, that's a good point. No, I did not. I've watched a lot of people change. Steve Wilson called him Curl. That was his nickname, big as arms. Are. He switched grips, tore his bicep right off. Brett Tracy, a good friend of ours, tore his other bicep right You know, So, uh, no, I never switched. I figured there's nothing to tear off. Why would I switch? And, uh, oh, I want to go on. Well, we'll move up into 91 um, when I had another <laughs> a catastrophic injury. But a small one, because I was bored, I'd never done any real curls. So I was in a leg cast, which we'll get to in a moment. Mm -hmm. And I was doing curls of a massive 145 and tore this bicep off. Now, John can tell you what happened, because now th this one never hurt at all. But this one felt like is um, gasoline burning my arm off for two, three days. And it knotted up right here. I tore the bottom of that bicep off. Yeah. And so John can explain. Yeah, so you can actually see where, can you guys see yeah. this? <laughs> yeah, you can actually see where the... Uh, the bicep basically came off and rolled up right down to here onto the uh, aponeurosis right there. Yeah, so it's pretty. Uh, so can, uh, can you see the lump of yeah. tissue I'm going over? <laughs> yeah, so there's a bunch of uh, connective tissue that uh, <laughs> is torn or was torn, and then uh, basically that's how it healed. And actually, uh, you know, it never stopped me either. I just kept right on going, kept getting bigger and bigger benches. But I just did it, uh, you know. Very high repetitions, um, you know, like reverse hypers. I give my guys even heavy weights. They do no less than 20 with heavy weights. The low back is nothing but basic ligaments and tendons. Am I right? Yeah, you got a lot of musculature down there, but yeah. it's small dick. Uh, it's very small, dense tissue. Mm -hmm. you so know it mean? needs high repetitions exactly. for blood supply. That's why you don't want to do five reps. Tom, we had an email the other day about a, a guy asked me. I got to reply to him, so maybe he's listening about maxing out in reverse hybrid because he talked about muscle types and he thinks he's done it wrong because we do 30. You don't max out or single in a reverse hybrid. Yeah, and the thing is too, when you look at the musculature that's down into in the low back, uh, mm -hmm. the low back is, is technically there. A lot of it is to actually prevent motion from occurring. That's why the spinous process it. And so w when stuff functions more in an isometric sense, meaning it, it's trying to inhibit a motion from occurring, you're gonna need more, uh, more repetitions to really get it. Right? Does that do you, do you understand what I'm saying? That's because exactly it, why we do it. Yeah, because if it's isometrically, you know, if you're just doing a hold, right, and now you're trying to get that same type of uh, stressor in there, you're going to need a lot higher reps because the repetitions are, are significantly quicker. You know, if you uh, kind of understand what we're coming, I come from experience and uh, trial and error, but John says actually why it works. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I tried it a million ways wrong before I found the right way. Never, never be afraid to look stupid either. Try anything until you find a thing that works. Tell me, got any more questions about the low back? Um, just a lot of traction and a lot of abs. You cannot do too much abs. Mm -hmm. Cannot do them. Um, no, I, I want to move on to uh, 91, on to uh, when uh, you had you ruptured your patella tendon. Yeah. Uh, can you just go how it happened and, and then what you did afterwards? Actually, I used to uh, run big cranes and... Uh, 
I hope my foot on the brake on mechanical cranes kind of wore my knee on. I also hyperextended my knee on ice one time. It's 1985. I tore this off in 91, squatting. But really, it was due to a construction injury, uh, you know, related injury. But I, I tore it off, and um, I had complete ruptured patella tendon. And it, it's a long story, but also, while I was in the hospital, I, I took me to the hospital and operated on me. I'm allergic to anesthesia. And when I went back in 14 weeks later, I had wires taken out. They, they gave me a shot to calm me down. They gave me a, a hooked me up anesthesia and almost died. They ended up cut, after I didn't breathe for four minutes, they went and got a doctor and cut my throat, treat me, put chest tubes in me while I was rolling around. That was a lot of fun. It's, it's really destroyed. They, they believe it. several intercostal with nerves. To this day, I have lots of rib problems, rib, rib pain. But anyhow, that's how I did it um, in the gym. Um, you know, I had Chuck Bogle and the guys. Thank God I had good spotters because it's two weeks before the senior nationals and I was going to Pittsburgh for the senior nationals. If I'd have gone over there, uh, because there was no monoliths and there's no safety straps to catch you. So, I mean, I'd probably come out with a broken leg and everything else. So, thank God I had good training partners. But, yeah, I blew it off. And actually, um, I had an 821 squat at the time. And, um, and I later, I, I didn't live for four or five years later because I thought I was 43 years old. And I said, well, I'm done. But then I got pulled out of retirement when I was like late 48. But I come back to squat 920. I had the second biggest squat in the country. Only Eddie Cohn had a bigger squat. To me in 2000 in the 242s, I weighed 233. Now I'm not, I'm just saying, but that's how I recovered it. And it all started back years ago, you know, um, with um, Matt Dimmel. Uh, Matt ruptured both patellas and tore the quadriceps tendons off. Matt had a world record 1,010, and we got him back to 905, about 90%. Well, I actually went a 10% over. I went back 110%, you know what I'm saying? And um, Andy Bale, uh, he's been a professional wrestler. He's all out there on the East Coast. Andy had a 900-pound squat, complete ruptured patella. The surgeons tell him he's done. He can't do nothing. He calls me on the phone. I know Andy, you know. And he, he goes, well, what do I do? And I told him what to do. And he had a 900-pound squat. In one year after surgery, in a contest, he squatted 1,000 pounds. Now, can your therapist get you to that? That's a good question. Ask yourself that. No, you have to get yourself to that. The greatest accomplishment I've ever done, his name is Jim Hoskinson. I never met the man. He calls me on the phone. He's all depressed in a wheelchair. And I basically said, don't be, don't be a freaking puss. Get, I said, can you get out of that wheelchair? He says, yeah. I said, we got a wheelchair. You can pull a sled. I said, get the hell out of the wheelchair. I'm all over this guy, you know, because he's all depressed. And he's about ready to cry on the phone. And he gets out there. He pulls the sled for six months straight in sand down in Florida. That's where he's at. And he had a 744 squat. This guy came back. Well, in nine months, he came to my gym, and then I saw him. International Greco wrestler, 300 pounds. I go, I'm dead. And uh, he was a great guy, you know. But he, in my gym, in nine months, he squatted 890. He went on to squat 11, uh, 1107 after a 744. So no one's done. Right here's what gets done. You're, you're, it's all heaven and hell's right in your mind. He went back and he did a lot of forward and backward sled dragging where I mostly, it hurt my knee for some reason to go backwards. And I, I mostly did all forward sled dragging, but that, that's what recovered me. Um, I'll give you a couple uh, things we did. And, and um, in eight weeks, I had full extension. I had 125 degrees knee. I never went back. It just tested me on side backs. I never went back. And how did I get it? I rode an exercise bike backwards. And I kept dropping the seat to big, bigger rotations. And so it would bend my knee more and more and more. Now I'd break the scar tissue, it'd make me a little sick for four or five minutes, and I'd just jump right back in and do it again. And that's how I, that's how I brought my knee, got my range of motion back, which you have to do. And also box squats. Um, you know, there's a lot of athletes, as Tom can tell you, that uh, have knee injuries, they can box squat, but they can't full squat. You sit way back on the box where your shin, if this is your foot and this is your back, your butt, your shin's like this, there's no pressure to tell it at all. You have the leg curl to get out of there, so it builds the hamstrings, which is essential, for knee rehab, and um, and, that, and so that's how he did it. But it's in um, it's in, in six less than six months. I squatted 500 parallel box, and I hurt my hip a little bit. Both both made me go up past that five and a quarter. Now I want to do 550. I come back and I did that. Both of takes 575. Hurt myself again, and but he drove me right back. I took it to the edge just like John John Black did, and I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And when I went back and you know at um, you know at 50 years old, I squatted 920 pounds. Yeah, and I think that's really good advice. The training and, and and coming back from injury is no different. You know, you have the capacity of the tissues, and you're always trying to go right below or just right under what your capacity is. And then what happens is 
you progressively start to increase the capacity of the tissue. I mean, it, it's not right. It's the same. It's one and the same thing. One is you have, I guess, no injuries. And the other one, you have injuries, but you're treating the tissue in the same manner. Mm -hmm. You're trying to create adaptations, increase capacity of the tissue, so you have to keep stressors in there. Yeah, what I did, because um, two things. Once I was able, I pushed a wheelbarrow. A wheelbarrow is like a wheel with crutches. You know, if you, uh, if you get tired, sit the damn thing down. You got two handles and a wheel. And also, like what I did was, I hope this makes sense, I would maybe recover, let's say I was doing... Um, you know, 75% uh, on my good leg, 25 on my bad. But then, as a, and I would take long, methodical steps where I got one leg off the ground at one time. And then it went, you know, 70-30, 65-35, until I got it down 50-50. And that, that wheelbarrow was tremendous. My friend, uh, Jesse Kellum, down in uh, New Orleans, trained a lot of saints, and that's, uh, he told me to try that, and I did it. And also, the sled dragging, the two best things I ever did. Now, as time went on, and I got the sled dragging by accident from the fence, who pulled wood out of a uh, uh, a lot of lumberjacks held world record deadlifters. I had the world record in the deadlift. So my friend Eskel Thompson, a Swede, who moved here and stayed 10 years with us, he went back, when he went back, he went to Finland and asked what, why, they, why they weren't. They didn't know they were lumberjacks. They told him how they pulled the wood. So I really stretched the sled dragging. And actually, uh, in my opinion, and Chuck Vogelpohl said the same, that sled, pulling sleds made him and I stronger than weights. I pulled 775 dead of the straps, and all I was doing was pulling uh, heavy sleds. Yeah. So, and to me, it, it was incredible. And, and heavy war barrels, you know, heavy war barrels. Nowadays, um, I know more. And also what I did, uh, I'm going to let John explain this more. But your calves support the knee on the bottom. Your hamstrings support it on top. So, forget about the thigh extensions. Because, John, you can't do a thigh extension standing up. Am I correct? No. Yeah, it's impossible. So, you want to do the hamstrings and the, and the, and the calves. And what I found was a lot of seated calf was actually more, because I was standing up walking all the time, did a lot of seated calves, and I did a lot of glued hand raises and band leg curls, and also ankle weight leg curls. I wrote about several times about a world champion high jump female, and she did 200 leg curls every day with 10 pound ankle weights. Got a coach that wanted her to stop doing it. She did, she got hurt. She went back and never quit doing them, never had an injury. So you got, it's the hamstrings and the calves. That's, that's what it is. And, uh, so, you know, a lot of uh, glued hams, a lot of band leg curls, leg curl, just flying down. Um, what do you call them? When you belly down. We have a stand up leg curl machine. So, um, you, you name it. And also, one thing that really worked a soft tissue for me was I would walk, I didn't have sand. I, and like my friend Jim walked in sand in Florida, but I got a foam pad. And I walked in that foam pad and with no shoes on. And that really seemed to help uh, the mobility or the strength of the ligaments, tendons of my knee. So we did a lot of stuff out. I mean, here at Westside, like at Tom, you saw a guy this morning squat a grand out of sitting in foam, you know, in a pair of briefs. So we do a lot of foam squats and stand in it and set on it. And it really seems to build, as strong as they are, it actually works their stabilizers even more. Yeah. So um, I'll let you explain a little bit, you know, well, about why you have to work the hamstrings and the, and the calves for knee rehab yeah. or, or prehab, which I like I mean, to do. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of like the non-contact ACL injuries that, that we see in, you know, like the NFL and some of these other sports, uh, it, it's basically they have too much flexibility and not enough mobility. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the hamstrings, uh, basically they, they start on your sit bone uh, and then they go to either side of the tibia and the fibula, which is uh, the uh, calf or the shin bone. And then you have the gastrox, uh, which come up, and then they attach to the backside of the femur. And uh, this musculature really helps protect the knee from going anteriorly forward. So it basically helps eccentrically break the knee, right? Because uh, a muscle produces uh, concentric force, but also eccentric force. And it's very important that the hamstrings can function eccentrically to slow that athlete down. So that's one of the reasons why I do a lot of the um, the inverse leg curl, but I overload the eccentric phase, meaning I'm literally preventing motion from occurring in the eccentric phase, and then someone actually lifts me up in the concentric phase so that I don't I don't fatigue the hamstrings concentrically, and then I lower again eccentrically, and so it really builds the, the gastrox and the, and the hamstrings up in a functional setting. Two, two things. Bob Peoples, uh, Tom, you've seen Bob Peoples' book. He did a lot of, um, um, you know, heavy eccentrics. 
and he had a he had, his tractor had a PTO on it, power takeoff, and would pick the weights back up, and he'd do another rip, just slow lowering. And you know, a lot of injuries occur in ball uh, from the deceleration phase. Yeah. And I've seen all kind of coaches work on these deceleration, but he didn't do anything to strengthen it. Yeah, and see, that's the thing is you got to figure, figure a muscle's an organ, and it produces force, but it also has to break it, uh, break force from occurring. Right. So you have to train all aspects of it. You know what I mean? And a lot of a lot of times, people that don't actually lift weights, or they lift them and they don't really pay attention during the eccentric phase, they're going to start to just like. You know, if you only did bench press but no back training, mm -hmm. you're going to start to create some sort of imbalances, yep. and that's that's when you start to see the issues is is when you're too concentrically strong, so you can produce all this force, but you can't break it. So it's like having a race car with you know the brakes of a Honda Civic. That's exactly right. You know. Yeah, and you know, uh, you see so many athletes non-contact injuries. That's pathetic. I'm sorry, guys. That's pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> you got to build them up. Non-contact. You explain that to your coach. Your star running back hurts himself on a field by himself with no contact. Explain that to the head coach. Yeah. If you still got a job. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be afraid to make him strong. Like I said, he can explain scientifically, and you're talking about a gentleman that's got an article about it. And But if you put 11 weak kids on a field and 11 strong kids on a field and they play, 11 weak kids are going to get hurt on that field. Right. Straight up. That's what's going to happen. That's what separates men and women athletes. Strength. Yeah, I think a lot of people assume that the bat, the body is very fragile, and uh, you know it, it is fragile to an aspect of it. But that's what training does is it makes it stronger, right? And so if you if you're not training, you're becoming more fragile. If you're training, you're becoming more anti fragile, right? And so that's the reason why when you get injured, you shouldn't be saying I need to rest this. You should be saying, okay, how do I test the capacity of these tissues and find their threshold? And then how do I start to progressively overload it in a safe setting where I can increase the capacity of these tissues? Because the only reason why you have an injury is because you didn't have the prerequisites required to do what you were trying to do. Meaning you, your physical capacity wasn't a good match for the demands, thus the demands won. So if you're gonna go right back into doing the same demands, you better increase the capacity. Does that make sense? And you have to do it by putting yourself into those positions and training them again. That's the reason why you, you can't say that X range is dangerous, X exercise is dangerous. It's not dang, It's only dangerous if, if, you are, if you're a bad match for the demands. And the way that I look at it is you shouldn't say, it, like for instance, if somebody comes to me and they go, okay, I have bad shoulders, and the reason why I have bad shoulders is because of the bench press. No, the reason why is you didn't, your shoulders didn't have the capacity to do what the bench press demanded, and you just avoided it, right? right? And so eventually it's gonna wear down your shoulders. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, and again, you got to do high repetition training. Tom, you need enormous amounts of weights we lift, but we do thousands and thousands. You brought this up. Why don't we have soft tissue injuries here? Because we do thousands of repetitions with very light weights for the ligaments and tendons, softly connected tissue. You know, if you look at deformation, um, uh, you were saying it a moment ago about, you know, if you look at deformation, if you look at Hooke's Law of Elasticity, it all works together. It, when a ball, if I took a brittle ball, if this ball was brittle and I threw it down and it flexed, it would break. But if this was a basketball, I throw it down, it would have deformation, it would flatten out the bottom, and that, that portion of flattening would propel the ball upward. And your body works the very same way in the feet. And so that's why you got to do exercises thicken ligaments and tendons. No one ever thought about it. boxers would jump rope for two reasons conditioning and timing. But no one ever thought about thickening ligaments and tendons. That's why they got fast feet. That's one of the reasons they got fast feet. It, it's a, it's a, a, a side effect of jumping rope. It actually made fast feet by jumping rope, contacting, right. getting off the ground. Exactly. So, but it's, um, remember, if you've got brutal ligaments and tendons, and that's when you're an old man, you're going to get hurt. You have, you have to have full range of motion. Bitch, no exercise is dangerous. Everybody does the damn things. So it, it's you as are dangerous. If you're not yeah. prepared to do it, you're going you're, you're gonna to prepare to get hurt. People have, when people come to me for treatment and they have an issue doing a certain exercise, it's interesting, they always seem to blame the exercise. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that mode of thinking, anytime I, someone comes to me and they got an issue, I say, okay, here's the individual's demands and you can't meet the demands. I don't look at the demands being the issue. I look at you being the issue. You don't have the capacity to, to do the demands in a good, so why don't we increase performance? Right? And that's where it has to go back. It's the same thing. You tear your bicep. What does that tell you? That tissue wasn't biologically strong enough. Right. So what do you do? You start to train it. 
I mean, it's it's very common sense uh, way of doing it. And that's where it's like uh, the quote that you said earlier of the surgeon from Cleveland that said that, that it, it, it's very true. Therapy uh, should be no difference in training, and it's one in the same. Yeah, you know, if you look at exercise, you hear about uh, so many coaches do power plates for explosive power. This is ridiculous, guys. Just unless you're using 30 to 40%. There's no exercise, there's no explosive exercise. You know, I mean, with barbells. It's the percentage, it's how, what the velocity is, obtained is while you're doing it. All right? And also, there's no dangerous exercises. Why do my guys deadlift 900 pounds? They don't even get sore backs. There's no, if you know how to do something, it, driving a car can be dangerous if you don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> so, you just got to know how. And, um, Tom, you got more questions on, uh, where are we at? On my knee, right? We're on to, uh, yeah, from 91. We, we got, are we? Yeah, I fully recovered. Yeah. I want to bring up another point. Now, I know this is extreme, but I'm kind of an extreme person. Um, I tore a meniscus. I did it three times. Hurt my meniscus. And so I, I let it, re and I let it, it, it got okay, and I trained. I hurt again, and I got okay, and I trained. And uh, right before I was going to the World Cup uh, over in the IPA, I hurt it again. And I got mad. I said, hell, I'll just get it operated on. It's the worst thing I've ever done. All right? Diamond got into surgery like a month later. It was okay again. But uh, I went in, and it was operated on Tuesday morning, come out, come out of recovery, Put the crutches on my shoulders, walked out of the hospital, went and had breakfast. That Friday, I squatted. Now, if you want to ask Chuck Vogelpohl and Dave Tate, who was right there with me, I did a normal squat workout. You get guys with meniscus operation, uh, I'm not going to mention a few basketball players, they don't play for six months. It's ridiculous. To, Moshashi said to do nothing about it was worthless. And that's my feeling. I mean, what the hell? They just took something out. It's not like they sewed something together. So I had a little bit of blood seepage, and that was it. But I just went right on, and it sailed right up to where I was. Yeah. And it's interesting too, uh, there's actually been some studies done on actually the specifics of the meniscus surgery. And, it, and it's interesting, they, they've had people who actually have the surgery yeah. and people that not have the yeah. surgery and what they did was tra they basically trained. They were in some sort of therapeutic slash training center where they were loading tissues. And they did the, they did the results and the results that have come back as I haven't, I've, this was maybe like last year, is the people that opted to not have the surgery actually did better yeah. or you know when they do the questionnaires on top of it so it's not just a range of motion standpoint but it's also the questionnaire i wish i'd never had to operate on i have no lateral i don't know how fighters do it i have i can't move laterally you know what i mean yeah never could really anyhow but i definitely can't do it yeah. really got old yeah <clears throat> tom where are we at we are from 91 um on the knee the Inverse curl, is, is that, would that be a good uh, tool to have to rehab your knee? Inverse curl is one of the greatest devices, I, I think. It's the greatest hamstring machine I've ever seen. It makes uh, glute hams obsolete. If anyone knows what a Russian leg curl is, where I would hold your ankles down on the ground and you can curl down, touch your chest, not fall, and curl back up, you're one strong dude. We have people to do, um, I've got a girl who does uh, three sets of 10, all right? We had a 340 pound person, Tommy, that, you won or lost money on. I won. That did nine and a half reps, mm -hmm. 340. He had a 900 dead. We also had a kid that was 320 pounds, did six. And I'm sure, you know, that was uh, Jake Anderson, 875 deadlift. He would have he would have broke that if he had kept going. Um, but that's how you can go to step one, never being able to do it, to step 10, being able to do 10 reps. And we act, and I've got guys that do them, hold on to a 35 pound plate. That's why, uh, you know, um, Simon Joe went from a, a 525 deadlift and slightly less than two years to 725 deadlift at 193. Now, hamstrings is essential. Uh, John, we're talking about the inverse curl, and if you would please explain again about the knees. Why the inverse curl is so beneficial for to keeping knees healthy? Yeah, one of the things I really like about the inverse curl in in comparison to maybe like a seated or lying uh, hamstring curl is a seated or lying hamstring curl, the only thing that you're moving through time and space is your tibia. With the inverse leg curl, you got to move your torso. And in athletics, you're moving your torso or your whole body through that range. Uh, the reason why it's so good is the same thing we said about the gastrox and the hamstrings, how they protect the knee, how you can overload. The, the interesting part is, like, think about trying to overload the eccentric phase on a hamstring curl. It's kind of hard to do because someone has to physically lift it up. Right. Then that person, right? Because if you're trying to overload, you know, an eccentric or a concentric, like you said, uh, remember like the, the individuals that were in weightlifting, 
or, or track and field, what they would do is they pull concentrically, but they would drop the eccentric, mm -hmm. right? Because they didn't want to, they didn't want to get the uh, training adaptations from the eccentric. Well, when you're, you, when you want the training adaptations on the eccentric phase, you want to overload it as much as possible, right. right? So the inverse leg curl enables me to do that. And from a bodybuilding perspective, eccentric phase is very important. Mm -hmm. And so what I like to do is I like to, to train my hamstrings to concentric failure. Then as soon as they're concentrically failed, now the work begins because now I'm working on an eccentric. And I'm trying to think about it. Your hamstrings just have to be strong enough to prevent you from, from going down. And there's a really big issue if you can't eccentrically control your torso from going down. So it could almost just be an assessment for actual athletes mm -hmm. to say, hey, is this person at risk for a knee injury? Mm -hmm. If they can't eccentrically control their body on the eccentric phase, I mean, it'd be interesting to do a study to see knee issues with people that have that can't eccentrically control themselves in that setting, and then see how they do in whatever athletic endeavor that they're in. You know, a lot of people overlook the point that you just brought that up. That's an assessment, and that's why that's why reverse hyper is an assessment of your lower back, inverse curl, the hamstrings, right. the belt squats, the hips. Everything we do is an assessment here. Yeah. And one of the things that I do in, in the guys that, that I train with, because we do the reverse hyper multiple times a week, same thing that, that, that all the lifters here do, and it's interesting, I'll get a guy in there that has back pain, right? They're like, man, I have low back pain. I always get low back pain when I, when I squat, you know, so I can't squat, right? Or the squat's bad for me. Same thing. It's like, no, your spine doesn't have the capacity right. to do what is required of the squat. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to get them in the reverse hyper, get their spine functioning again. And when you talk about an assessment, if you get into a reverse hyper and let's say that there's maybe 50 pounds on there, so relatively lightweight, and you start to get impingements, okay, this is a clear, clear indicator that your spinal joints don't function, right? So now the first thing that you should do if you're a coach or if you're a therapist, because this is one of the things that I use for people that have acute situations uh, or the, that have an acute injury and now we're in the actual... Um, we're in the rehabilitation uh, process. As I say, do you feel any pinch points? No, no pinch points. And you're really trying to acquire range of motion in that setting where there's traction. So it's not the camel cow situation because in the camel cow, there's no traction. And then also there's no weight. So what I'll start to do is I use ankle weights to start to load that extremity, which increases traction, but also increases us loading those tissues, right? So think about it as an assessment for, uh, for to see if you have a functioning spine, go into the reverse hyper and see if you can do it. If you get joint pain in the reverse hyper, guess what? Your spine isn't functioning how it should, and you probably should load the spine because you got a dysfunctional joint, mm -hmm. but what other exercise or what other setting can you put an individual in safely and get that assessment? Yeah, none that I know of. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I use it is one, because it feels good. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. from, from that standpoint of, of basically starting to get functionality back into the spine, but if I have a pinch point, right, or if I have any type, I know I'm not, I'm not going to just go in and then lift mm -hmm. because I'm going to do damages to my disc, to my joint, mm -hmm. all that other stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, you brought up a point of ankle weights, too, because I tell people all the time just wear ankle weights around. Basically, in bench press workouts, it's traction, and you're not even, you don't even know they're on there. Well, yeah, and, and you had told me before you had the pendulum that that's what you did anyway. Right. And when you think about it, the pendulum pulls you under. Right, which there's a lot of benefit to that, but there's also a lot of benefit to just coming straight down too. That's right. So you can technically do both at the same time. A lot of times I, I, I basically do one or the other or m m use them in combination with each other. Well, years ago when I pulled 710 at 195, I didn't have reverse hyper. I did them manually up in a power rack. And my, I, at that time I did 10 with 200 around my ankles. And I I'd set a 10 and I got a set of eight with 200. Yeah. And I mean, that's a pretty strong lower back, you know, for about 195 pounds. Right. So, yeah. We, we've we talked a lot about the hamstrings and how we train them on the posterior. What role do the quadriceps training them play in your rehab, if any? I I didn't do any. <laughs> you know, I didn't do any to come back and, you know, I mean, you know to do the squats I did. Uh, I just didn't because it seemed like it had cheering force on my knee. Yeah, so here's the interesting part too, right? <clears throat> okay, if you're not going to box squat and you're not going to go full range of motion squat, you're shearing your knee, right? But if you had the box, now you're not shearing your knee because there's equal distribution in front to back of the joint, right? For me, I don't actually do a lot of quad training and I actually have pretty decent developed quads. My training partner has massive quads. We do maybe some single joint exercises at the very end but if, if, if you're doing a controlled 
uh, squat repetition, the, you're going to get your training in the eccentric phase. That's right. Not really concentrically. Eccentrically. I mean, if you're doing your hear, squat wrong. You hear wrong, that weightlifters? <laughs> if, you're doing, if you're doing your squat wrong, mm -hmm. you're going to feel it in your quads, correct? <laughs> yes. And that's why a lot of people are like, I feel it. it, it and for me, there's a point where if you're doing a full range of motion squat, initially your quads have to pull you up to the point where your hips are biomechanically and be able to drive through. But after that done, after, after that phase, the only time I ever feel it in my my uh, quads is on the eccentric phase when I'm doing full range of motion squats. There's there's topping muscles. Correct. You know, I, whenever we get a guy, oh, I'm a quad squatter, then I know right away that he does not know how to squat. Yeah, because if you, you better be a glued hamstring squatter. Hips. Right. Yeah, because that's all the tissues on the back side of the joint. That's right. You know what I mean? And that's the tissues that's going to drive your hips forward and end the repetition. Well, it holds a house at the foundation. So when you're in the bottom of the squat, it's the back of your body holding the house up, not the top of your body. Right. And see, that's the funny part, too, is that's where I use the box squat for bodybuilders, right? Because a lot of them, they leg press all day. Yes. And leg press, you're just moving your feet, right? And so they, they learn the mechanics of a leg press, and they try and do those mechanics in the squat. So they're doing the same thing where they just overload their quads. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's horrible, right? But if you use the box, now you can actually sit back and actually load the glutes and the hamstrings. Now, when you're sitting back there, if you use your quads to get out of it, it's going to look horrible because right. your your hips are going to shoot back. It's just, you're basically leg extending, leg extending, and then back extending it up. But I like to use the uh, the the box because then it sets your hips, and then you're able to just drive the hips through. We're going to explain box squats in a coming up podcast completely why you have to do them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think that covers that. Is that covered that yep. time? I just, I just, it just hurt my knees. I mean, it, hurt, it made my knees worse, but I'd never done it. Yeah. Well, that was 91, and I'm sure from 91 upwards, you've encountered many more injuries and developing the injury-free system we have today. But in uh, 2005, you had a hemicap, a soccer, uh, put into your shoulder. Yes. Um, from that... Can you explain how quick you came back from that surgery and what, what, what first, what caused your shoulder to give out? Okay, uh, what caused my shoulder to give out, and I think I hope a lot of doctors listen to this. I, in my opinion, I broke my neck in 93 benching, drive my head in the bench. So I never drove my head in the bench anymore. I heard it snap. And about four or five weeks later, all of a sudden, my, my, I think my left shoulder started hurting real bad. It would stay that way for four or five months. Then one day, it didn't hurt at all for a couple of days, and then went to my right. And it went back and forth from 93 to when I finally got this replaced. It froze up in you know late 2004 and got the socket in 2005. But that's how I came to get it in. I believe it was a vertebrae problem, not a, not a shoulder problem. It yeah. caused me frozen shoulder and then I had to get a shoulder. But what I done was, um, I, the doctor, Dr. Miniachi was working for the Browns and I was going up there with David, the era of, of, of Davis when he was uh, coaching the, high, uh, mission, um, the Browns and I would go up there so he has said he had this new, this uh, the socket that you're talking about, new experiment. Only one person, some lady karate person done. So he, and, and so Buddy Morris, a strength coach, good friend of mine, said, this thing's right up your alley. He says he wants people to experiment to literally see if you can tear it out. I'm, 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 well, I'm ready to go. And uh, I had, what I had to lose? I mean, I couldn't, you know, I asked the Browns guys, the trainer, hey, I can't put my hands in my pocket. What would you have said? You wouldn't be here. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't even be here. So he operates on it. And okay, this is what I did. Remember, this is what I did. I'm not telling you to do this, but I talked to another surgeon, and I got home, and um, my arm was all swelled up, and the blood draining into it. And he said, take lots of anti-inflammatories. So I was pushing about 400 milligram of Voltaren a day. I, I was I've been on Voltaren since '91 when I got trached and all. So I pushed up the, a massive amount of Voltaren. Uh, in a few days, the swelling rapidly came out. Then I used heat. He told me to use heat. So I got in a hot tub. Seven days after surgery, I, I called Paul Childers, but he said, well, what should I do? He says, get range of motion. Touch your chest, put a bar in the back. I said, okay. So I took a broomstick, and I, I touched my chest in seven days, started benching that broomstick, low my, on my belly, high on my belly, across my throat, or whatever, and fighting it behind my head, okay? Then, so I started attaching small weights on that broomstick, but it wasn't a whole bunch. So we have a band bell bar. Uh, Tony Ramos actually came up with hooking kettlebells to a barbell, and then a friend of mine, Jimmy Seitzer, actually came up, made a bar that vibrates uh, with the hooking kettlebells and many bands to it. So I started using a, a bar like that, and I did 50 reps a set 
I would do between three and uh, uh, three and four sets every day, 150 to 200 reps. I start adding more and more weight, more and more, you know, just little weights at a time. And in three months, in a reg with a regular bar, I bench 300. All right. Now, normally in three months, you're, you're still in the cast. They want you to be in an arm cast. So that's the progress I made. And I, I did it by using the barbell bar with all the vibrations. I'm not sure. No one's ever told me, but I believe it puts max and contractions into soft tissue. I think that's why it works. Now, I came back with that to, um, uh, I had a 405 raw bench with the socket in, and I could do 270 for nine with that bar. All right, now I watched Dave Hall, you know, our strongest guy, he was doing 335 for 10s. But I mean, so, as stronger I got with the vibrating bar, the stronger I got with the regular bar. And at 63, I benched 505, and I did it 675 with that socket. But that's basically how I did it. I started out with the band bar. All right, and a lot of uh, external rotation, just a band like this, you know, pulling it apart, starting light, and working my way up. All right, and uh, that's I, I did that, and the high reps, and I also used very light dumbbells. I, I, I had 10 pound dumbbells, I would do 50, I mean, I, I have done 200 reps with 25 pound dumbbells in one set. And I, I mean, I'm old, I got nothing else to do, you know what I mean? But I did that just to blow me up. And, and put the, the blood in the ligaments, the tendons, and it worked. And, you know, dumbbells, you can turn your arm. If you look, you see that? Well, where did they cut me? John can explain. That's as high as that arm goes. So I got, I got a big discrepancy there. So that's why I use dumbbells. And, um, but that band bar brought me back uh, completely. And then three months after, when I benched at 300, I also had this shoulder scope. And, um, you know, so anyhow, all in all, I totally recovered from it. I mean, a four or five bench with a big shoulder is not bad at all. And, uh, but that's what I did. A lot of dumbbells, a lot of band bars, and um, a lot of high reps. So if you want to mention anything about the band bars, what you've done with it? Yeah, I use the band bar pretty regularly. He just came out with a newer bar. I don't know if you guys have messed around with it, the uh, Rhino bar, where you actually load the plates on there. Have you guys messed no. with it? Yeah, I, I like it a little bit better. It's, it's, it, I can use more actual weight mm -hmm. on the bar. But yeah, I mean, I love the band. I, I think what it, what it does uh, from a perspective is I kind of use it as an assessment. So if someone's using a, a regular bench press bar and they get pain, right? Kind of how I look at it is it's a discrepancy in the the large muscles, right? So so like the pecs are actually too strong for more of the muscles that are guiding the force to that joint. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? So what I have those individuals do is then a lot of band battle uh, type work so they can start to really uh, emphasize the smaller stabilizing muscles, but at the same time still train their prime movers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it really helps with like the uh, joint integrity and how the joint actually functions because you know you can train you know internal external rotation like this all day long, but that's not going to really that's not very applicable to a bench press. No, you know what I mean. Well, you know uh, we have the biggest full meat bencher in the world, Dave Hall, a thousand five, and we have a. a Jason uh, Coker holds two world records, 998 and 771 and 181. Um, th those guys use that bar all the time. We a uh, whole gym use that bar all the time. Am I right, Tom? That a lot of times I'm, I see Jason warm up with the bar, and, or many times when they're done, they'll finish with the bar. Yeah, and I was talking to Jim about this. If you, if you think about it, like it's kind of like that foam, right? You're walking on the foam. Like when you think about a regular barbell, it really doesn't adapt to you. So all that force goes into the joints. Mm -hmm. In this bar, the bar actually adapts. Yeah. Right. So so it's not as hard on your joints. No. Does that make sense? Well, yes, because as someone has to explain to me, if you took a bench press and, and lost it, dumped it, you hurt yourself. This bar, you could go on your belly. It could flop across your neck, and I've never seen a guy get hurt. Yeah. Now I'd like to get some physiologists here to tell me why. Yeah. You know, they need to come here and learn. That's how the Russians got so strong. They sent scientists to their weight programs, and they, and they side by side. That's where exercise and science actually meet, not in America. Well, well and see, that's it's the, got a fancy name, but it does. There's no correlation between exercise and science. Sorry, that, guys. That's the funny part is generally all the evidence-based stuff comes from someone doing it before there was any study. Oh yeah, of course. And then they figure out that something works. Let's study it and figure out why it works. There's people right? that. So all these people that are like, I'm only evidence-based, well, guess what? They didn't just randomly pick that study for no apparent reason. It's because someone was actually applying something, and they say, hey, I'm getting results. Let's research this and figure out what it's doing. Yeah, Tommy, how many uh, search papers have you seen on bands and chains? And I've been doing these things for freaking 25 years. You know, but they're doing them now, and they think it's revolutionary. Yeah. And that's what, you know, man, well, well, whatever. 
It was yeah. 25 years late, but better late than never. Yeah. You know, one thing about the band bar, too, I would use numerous grips to start a real close, work my way out. Every set, I would use a different grip. And also, I put the bar down on my belly like a lot of shirt benchers would, and a lot of, they call them the across my throat. So I moved the bar up and down, in and out. I hit every angle I possibly could. And it works real good on inclines and declines as well. Yeah. It works tremendous for tricep extensions. An upright row was... Upright row. I could never do an upright row, but I could do an upright row with that bar. I mean, these are the things I want to know why. Right. <laughs> but regular barbell would kill my shoulders. That bar, I could do it. I, it's, it amazes me. Yeah. It's, uh, that bar has been a, a lifesaver for a lot of our fighters and grapplers. Oh. Yeah, just uh, for uh, joint integrity and um, for keeping their shoulders healthy. And it, it's actually helped them reduce tendonitis. Especially from people, when you miss a punch, you lock out that arm. Oh, it's, yeah. It's been, I mean, oh. it's been huge. Yeah, now yeah. How many, there's tons of injuries yeah. for overextension in boxing. And uh, another thing that I found to it'll help uh, build up the upper body endurance is the quasi-isometrics we did with the, the bambell bar. We do that for time from one minute to two minutes to three minutes. Up you to talk five about minutes. holding the bar. Yeah, and, um, but you hold it and, for different positions yeah, the whole way through. Yeah. It's, I mean, and thankfully, touch wood, we've had very little... Injuries with yeah, because you use isometrics a lot in training with your fighters, especially the spine, especially the abs, and all that other stuff. And that's the interesting part. That's the setting that I use it in from a therapeutic way, right? Because when you think about an isometric and you start to think of all the advantages of that contraction, right? You got to figure, you know, one, there's no joint shearing because there's no motion, two, there's no tissue glide. So those are the two mechanical properties that create inflammation, right? And so you don't have that. Then all the physiological adaptations from actually doing the contraction occurs 10 to 15 degrees above and below that specific angle. So you're really able to start to acquire these end ranges or these beginning ranges that you never go into. Does that make sense? And that's generally where the injuries occur. Right. So it's like, it's, like, it's like, remember when we were eating with Dan, uh, Dan from Melbourne Storm? Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, you know, training is figuring out how to distort something so that you can distort it, then overload it. Well, look at isometrics. That's exactly what it is. Right. Right. So you can train your fighters or you can train the lifters in this safe setting and you could start to overload and capture something that they don't have. We do quite a few isometrics and also what Tom's doing, you know, uh, you can do, I mean, he does it for one, two, three minutes, five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Because you can breathe. Same thing in a bell squat. You can get in a bell squat and get in a skater's pose or any kind of pose and you can breathe. Uh, you know, you can only hold your breath so long. I mean, that's one uh, problem with isometrics. If you pull maximally, you hold your breath. Uh, but I've saw studies by the old Soviets, and they said that exactly what Tom's doing, by using submaximal isometric tension for a long period of time, is just as effective as pulling maximally. Yeah, and see, that's the funny part, too, is like one of the fighters that was having back spasms that we were working with, right? The first thing that we do is if you're having, if you're having that neurological issue, you need to go into that range, and you need to start getting good inputs into that range not rest it yeah do you know what I mean because the spasm or the neurological issues is occurring because of some input so you need to get another input in there to start to show that hey no it's safe to function there there's too much neural drive going into the tissues and so it's the same thing where Tom was able to put these guys in the reverse hyper and start to isometrically load them in the reverse hyper at specific angles so think about that if, if you're worried about the any sort of uh, mo uh, uh, motion in your spine on a reverse hyper, you can go there. It's an open chain setting. You can apply manual force into that range and start to acquire those ranges very safely. What about when someone's trying to arm bar you and you're trying to hold it out? And you know, you gotta, you gotta be able to be real strong in those weird positions. You know, where my arm would never even get. Or even wrist control isometrically. You know, you could, I got good wrist control on you. You know, it's a fight to get, bust that wrist loose. Well, do you notice the difference in individuals who squat? So a squat is an isometric contraction in your spine. Mm -hmm. You want all the motion to come from your hips, yeah. right? So when you start to see someone coming back and forth, what does that show you? They don't have isometric capacity in their spine. Right. So what do you do? Go to the reverse hyper, isometrically contract the tissue. A friend of mine, what's the exercise called? A cobra? What is it? Uh, you know, get on your stomach. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stuff. yeah My yeah. friend goes, oh, I do cobras. And I go, what? I said, what about, why well, you can't do a cobra on, uh, on a hyper extension? Why don't you lift the weight up and hold it to the rear? Mm, my friend. And he goes, oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> you could do that with uh, what we've said, resistance. You know, I want to go back to the shoulder, though. Two things. Um, I bought this right away. Couldn't use it in the beginning, so I just did partials. You know, just partials. High reps in here. Just rep after rep after rep. Hitting my shoulder any way, any kind of direction I could. You know, yep, both ways. You know, like this. And then, uh, then I finally got shown up just like a normal human. Just 
just pop that thing all kind of ways. I do a lot like this. And, and it built up, built up my shoulder and my anterior delts and so forth. This has been a lifesaver. And I got a stronger one I can finally use now. <laughs> and, uh, but also, um, straight arm pullovers. Now, I could not do straight arm pullover in the fence like most people. But I get in my lap machine, and, and Tom's done this with the guys. And I sit down on the lap machine facing away from it with a light weight and let it pull my arms over my head. I'm getting that weight resistance for, to gain range of motion. You know, weight resistance is the greatest way to build flexibility. You know, if you ever had a five inch camera bar and you can't touch it, put more weight on it. This year you're going to get it down there. Yeah. Right, it's extreme, but that's the theory. And I do a lot of straight arm, real close grip, real wide grip, getting, because you told me put a, you know, put my hand behind my head with a broomstick. Wow, that wasn't happening. Yeah. But that's kind of, you know, kind of like the beginning of what I do. But the, the pullovers, and I mean, I do things for four and five minutes at a time. I've done abs 15 minutes straight, static abs. The static abs, like you're grappling with somebody. So you want to do ultra high reps and just blow yourself up. You know, it's, it's basically called lactic acid tolerance training. Bodybuilder goes through this. You know, your arms are all blown up, you got 10 more reps. Then strip some weight, you got 10 more reps. Yeah, you know. 100%. Yeah. So anyhow, that's, that, that's pretty much how I, I rehab my shoulder. A lot of uh, upper back work and... Um, uh, a lot of band work and a lot of ultra, ultra high reps as I push my weights up. Yeah, and one of the things that I want to make a note of it, just because it always annoys me seeing people that just do band work where they let the band stretch them. Like, you're doing all the work there. Thus, you're actually... See, in order to increase capacity, you have to do some sort of work. You can't let the band do the work, right? You have to do the work. That's the reason why these machines like a reverse hyper are so invaluable. Because you can add load to them, work is being done, thus capacity is being increased. These people that want to hold these static stretches and they think that they acquire a useful range of motion, you just don't. There has to be some sort, you have to be doing work. A lot of people don't like doing this work because it's small detailed work that's really hard. And it's a process. But you have to do the work. I can't stress that enough. I see all these, I see people doing all these stuff with bands and stuff like that. And that's great if it makes you feel better and neurologically opens up a range that you can train, but then they're not training that range, right? And so th that's the most frustrating part from, a from me being a manual therapist's perspective is every time I work on someone, I'm having them do some sort of work. Does that make sense? So that yes. once they get up, they've increased their capacity in some way. We've loaded the tissues, there's neural drive there, there's sensory information, so that they're a better match for whatever their demands are. I've I've had linemen uh, you know hook up bands and, and hook it to a post and go out for like a you know blocking the you know the offensive lineman or defensive lineman what the case may be or for takedowns and runs I'm sure Tom does it so Coach Hedman says because I told my pulse so I said well why don't you just put a banner on your waist at their waist and hold, and give them resistance well Tommy don't you do this for a half a mile a mile mm -hmm. you want to walk behind with someone for half a mile a mile hold them I don't think so you know that's why I mean you got to be smarter than the weights. And like you said, you know, and you know, people in my sport, it's uh, for me for years, you know, I didn't want to take out the trash, you know, all I want to do is, you know, the big three lifts and get out. And the hardest thing in our sport, I think, is doing the small exercise. It doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but when they finally get it, they don't get hurt anymore. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, it's a crucial part of our sport that we got to train in these crazy ranges of motion mm -hmm. because fighting is very unpredictable. You got no idea where it's going to go. And back to your shoulder rehab I know you're the one who got me to do it but that uh, war wagon or that wheelbarrow shrugs yeah have been, oh, oh yeah the, those have been the, the biggest thing for my posture and my shoulders yeah, it's but, unbelievable but that and now we've been supersetting that with um, rows in the bell squat yeah. uh, you do them you're, I mean that that's a hell of a superset by keeping your posture up but again showed because of the arm locks and arm bars and just the way your shoulders go through them ranges of motion that wheelbarrow I now I've incorporated those um a lot of them pullovers in the lap machine. I mean, you can just see that their chest cavity, everything's opening up and, real good. And one arm will give you greater range than two arms. <laughs> yeah. I mean, anything you do, you can do a one leg split, but you can't necessarily do a two leg split. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point because your repository's really changed. Even it's helped your squat form because mm -hmm. now your shoulders are back farther. We've got a kid came here right now, very internally rotated. And uh, so that's what we're working on right now, trying to get that external rotation for his bench and his squat. Right. And we, in three months, we took him from a 900 squat to 1,000 in a contest. Yeah. But 160 on his total in three months. But we're, he definitely can go way up from that. But we've got to work on that external rotation. What I've noticed is it teaches your body what to do. 
especially in heavy weight, the first time I can actually feel my upper back contract and then I can lock something in um, and it actually worked w without doing things involuntary, like I could feel everything activating and for the first time driving up in a squat, I let it in my head and that normally doesn't happen, but you gotta do these thousands of reps to teach well, your body how to do. Well, well the funny part was, uh, I was working with this guy online uh, from the UK, he's a physical therapist this morning, right? He wants to acquire more internal rotation in his hip joint. So the system I use is called Functional Range Conditioning, FRC, right? It's isometrics, progressive and regressive isometrics. And it's funny, he realized how much it sucks to do the small work, right? Because I told him, I'm like, the issue is, you're doing it, but you're not isometrically loading enough. So I'd load them in an interval, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, right? Well, the issue was, I'd go, are you at 80%? Because you're not straining. He talks to me, yeah, this is 80%. No, if you're, if you're talking to me, you're not loading at 80%. Yeah. You're not straining nearly enough. And I think that's what people don't understand is how hard, like the work that you're talking about, if you, a lot of people may see the wheelbarrow and they're like, oh, that looks easy. But if you're, if you're actually controlling the wheelbarrow and not letting the wheelbarrow control you, yeah. Right, it's totally different. I mean, yeah. I can only do about two sets of of uh, I'll do ten reps one way, ten reps the other way, and my entire upper thoracic, all that musculature is is just it's trashed. Yeah, well, I noticed Tommy though uh, got a lot of bench press records too, and you start doing that wheelbarrow show. Yeah. You know, yeah. you got to have a strong upper back to bench, but and well, you can't be like this and think well, you're going to bench a lot. Yeah, because you got to be able to isometrically take your your shoulder blades and plant them. And then go into this joint and get range of motion in that joint to load your pecs. What I found over the years as I got older, I couldn't bench wide anymore. I used to bench illegal years ago as a training aid. And I found out the close grip, you will not work your scapula near as much of a close grip as you do wide grip. You have to do some wide grip somehow. Yeah, 100 To pull that scapula together. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So that's one thing. That's why I got you. Everybody wants to use this one grip. Uh, you can't, you got to use all these different grips. Bill Casmar used three different grips. I didn't know until I read it in Iron Man years ago. He used three different groups just like we do. I never told Bill to do it, and Bill didn't tell me to do it. But we yeah. both learned you got to use different grips. And, and just if you have a repetitive strain injury, mm -hmm. it's going to decrease if you're if you're always uh, changing it up uh, as far as your grips. It's going to reduce the repetitive strain injury as well because you're going to load tissues differently. Right. You know, and also like for the shoulder to think. Uh, now, although I did break my snap, my neck would drive my head in the bench. Um, but you want to train your neck. That's one of the muscles. Paul Hanks says the most neglected uh, muscle in the body. And there's pictures of Tom. I know he's swinging 215 around his head with a neck on his. Mm -hmm. 215. Not 215s. 215 pounds. We do lots and lots of neck. I like long periods of neck. Mm -hmm. You saw, I, I do it for five, six minutes at a time. Just hold him. Just like a Tommy having in a clinch or something. I just constantly, until I just blow it up. Then I turn around and do it in reverse. Right. You know, so I do ultra high reps. But... I don't know, uh, I think we cover a lot every time. I, I want to bring up a few things. Like a lot of people said, well, what have you done? Or how, how have you aided yourself in recovery? You name it, I've done it. We'll get into everything. But the common things, I've used prolotherapy. I've used a lot of saline injections, much as 48 cc's, as you too well know, in my neck, upper back. Uh, I've, used, I've had platelet injections, stem cell injections. You know, you give you stem cell and platelets. That seemed to work quite well. I mean, it's been about what? three months now mm -hmm. and uh, it's working real well I believe you you, you sometimes you need a chiropractor uh, uh, John uh, you're uh, what you're uh, I do FR release yeah functional range release mm -hmm. I had one of the best things I ever had when it was a good one town was a uh, rolling break out the scar tissue acupuncture if they're good acupressure <laughs> and um, you know so that covers a lot of stuff and uh, but you always look for a way there's a way out there don't give up on yourself Always get on. Tom's great on here. If I want to know something, Tom gets the internet. I don't know how to get on a computer, but if I want to know something, Tom's on the internet. Uh, he's got the answer to me in two freaking minutes. You know what I mean? And then we try it. And like I said, don't, I've had coaches, big coaches, they were afraid to do something because they thought they'd look stupid. I've never been afraid to look stupid. You know, if you do twenty things wrong but find one thing right, it could it can make or break a lifter in your gym or an, or a fighter or anything else. Yeah. Or a a, a, or a patient, and, and it's the same thing. Finding out what not to do is also pro That's progress. Right. Yes, right. It's I one of the same. Out. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're finding out the negatives. Don't do this. Don't do this. Yeah. Which gives you it puts you on the path to actually finding out what you need to do or what you right. can do. I believe the West Side system is the, safe, the safest system in the world. You got to remember, all these injuries started back in the early '80s. I have no idea. I did progressive gradual overload training, 
it was all wrong. That's where I accumulated a lot of these problems. And there was no gear. I mean, I made top 10 from 1980 to uh, 2002. 22 years, with and without shirts. And I did it because I got smarter. I didn't get any stronger. I just got smarter. Yeah. So you got to always try to find a better way. It's the same thing. If you train smarter, then you can train harder. That's right. Exactly. So. Too many guys train hard, get hurt, and they can't figure it out. Yeah. You got. You just got to go at it in a systematic approach. Yeah. Um, I've got a question that I'm sure that some people think about. Why did you not quit? Like you, you had all these injuries. A lot of people. They get a little nicks and they're gone. But what drives it? What drove you to from '73 all the way up to now? Because now you're the first person in the gym and last one out. Well, what 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 drove you to always seek an answer? I don't think I'm special. I think I was just born with no quit. I mean, I, my dad would never let me quit doing anything, you know. And uh, I mean, when I broke my back, I would I trained in my basement. I had a mirror and a radio. That was my training partner. I had no training partner for six years. And I would get down and look at that mirror, looking at myself, saying, how am I going to get well? What, I, like I said, I tried to do, I tried to do this, tried to do that. Tried, nothing worked. And, I, and then I just went in my own mind and, um, and thought about and basically went into a, a meditational state and said, you know, I went into emptiness, and that's what I practice a lot, and I came up with that exercise. But, I mean, all these things happened. I tore my knee off. My knee kept sitting on the side of my leg. And I, and I said to myself, how long is this going to take to fix? Not, oh, I'm done. You know, you, if you quit one time, guys, you're a quitter. Quit one time at anything, you're a quitter. You'll quit at anything. It sets you up to quit. And I, you know, I, I can't compete anymore because my, my knee's pretty bad in my neck. But I train all the time. And like I said, I'm, you know, the restaurant opens up at 6, I'm sitting there at 515. All right, like a stalker. I, you know, there's no way. I, 4 o'clock, I, my clock at 4 a.m. in the morning, I'm done. I got to get up. I can't take a chance of ever being late. And I'll be back here tonight. I don't know what time it is now. I'll be back late tonight doing another workout. I worked out already this morning. I'll leave here and do a little bit and come back late tonight. And, and, I, and people say, why do I like to train by myself? If you train by yourself, you really find out if you really want to train. If I ain't got Tommy up my ass saying, come on, Lou, you got to do another rep. Or you doing something. If I'm there by me saying, Lou, Lou, I got to do another rep. That's when you really want to train. But I mean, what all these injuries is how I came up with all these methods. And it was a hard way, but someone had to do it. Me and me and Dave Tate ruined our, our shoulder squatting with too much band. Rob Fusner and um, George Halbert ruined our shoulders uh, too much in the, in the bench. But someone had to do it. You know, I mean, you got to put too much salt in the food until you find out it's too much salt. We were just unfortunately the ones. I was never afraid to try anything. They weren't either. I had the greatest group of guys in the world. If I said, hey, well, I want to try this, oh, let's do it. You know, boys had experimental groups. The gym's nothing but experiment. Um, the hardest thing now, what's the hardest thing for us, Tom? Get a lifter. <laughs> a real lifter. I'm getting too old to take average. I don't need average. Average people will give you average results. You have to have abnormal people if you want abnormal results. What do you say to people out there who've been told by their, their doctors, surgeons, and um, physical therapists that they should stop or they should not, like... The people out there who have got injured since you've came back from so much, what's the biggest piece of advice you could tell them? Uh, uh, I, when I was getting operated on my sh shoulder uh, the last time, a woman said, "Why? Uh, what do you do when people tell you not to do this? I said, I don't hang around people to tell me not to do this. If you run with the limb, you develop a limb. I only hang around positive people. I got, I'm surrounded by very smart people, way smarter than me. And I, 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 use, I mean, I'm not, I use them, but I, I, they're at my disposal, and I let them, I give them lead way to do what they do best. And I, I think that's what makes a, you know, a, 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 a good, a, a successful anything, business, gym, you got to go in there. I mean, that's why, you know, John's a great a part of this gym. Uh, Tom, everybody, everybody in my gym. I can learn from the, uh, the least knowledgeable guy in my gym, am I right? I, that's where I learn, because I'm going like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? I mean, I grew up, with, you know, I was top 10 squat for, in five weight classes. If I see a guy doing house squat, I go, well, what's wrong with that guy? You know, because I come up with everybody, we learned, how they, I taught them, they were, you know, really good technicians. And then when I, and, but that's why I learned, well, this guy's doing it wrong. I got to explain what he's doing wrong. I mean, uh, you know, uh, that's what uh, Carla said, mm -hmm. that he, he learned, uh, he learned from bad guys, bad grapplers, bad jujitsu guys. Not good ones, because a good one, you'll be a stalemate for 20 minutes on the, on the mat. But a bad one, You'll learn, or you know, a guy you say, I'm going to get your arm and own your arm. So you got to protect his arm. That's how he got better. So that's what I do. I use, I, I, I learn from everybody. You know, everybody, oh, they think they know everything. 
And like I, I said, I asked the guy this morning, I said, you know, I'm not a religious person, but he is. I said, you read the Bible every day? And he goes, I read the Bible every day. I said, then why don't a coach read a book every day? You think you read a book one time and understand a book? You're crazy. I've talked to how many people, Tommy, that bought super training. I read super training. So what? You ain't got a freaking clue how to train. You know, I read boxing magazines, but don't know how to box. You know, you got to you have to you got to be in the trenches and do this stuff. You know, in, in your job, uh, you went to school, you had class, but when you actually got in it, you know, then you're responsible for your clients. That's when you really learn to be very good at what you do. Yeah, and, and, that's right. And when I've got a responsibility here. If a guy comes, tell me, ninety five percent of people in that gym moved here, haven't they? And I got we got a responsibility. You know, I mean, I can't have a mover and go backwards. And I can also say, the one guy just got removed from my gym. Uh, there was no, there was no hope for him. He could not do the training, and he, you know, is always and he came here hurt. And I, I, I have confidence in saying, if you come here and you don't get any better, you suck anyhow. Because this, I've never seen a system this good. I mean, we got too many people. There's too many stats to even consider at looking up. You know, lightest to squat first. You know. Um, Lightest squat a thousand, lightest to squat nine. You know, I mean, we're gonna have the another lightest at one sixty five is gonna squat nine. We have a one eighty one squat one thousand. I guarantee it. You know, what I mean, we've had so many things though that um, I can't even keep up the stats myself. I don't even go try. If you look at the greatest totals ever made, the top ten, we we load up on the top ten. You know, like the top sprint times in the world, a bolt holds probably four or five. So do we. You know, no one, no one can say that. Yeah. But I just, I can't, I don't have quit in me. I mean, like, I, you know, Tom, you do all my business. Right now we got two projects, mm -hmm. and they could be big money makers, and not that I care about the money, but I'm glad I, we haven't got them out there because I need something to look forward to every day. Got to have some kind of fight, mm -hmm. you know, till I die. You slow down, you go down. That's right. Well, other than that, I think we cover a lot in this um, podcast. I'd like to thank John. I'd like to thank Lou. This has been the Westside Barbell Podcast, and we'll be back with you guys really soon. Thanks, man. Oh, yeah, for sure.